Hello, friends. This is Pastor David from the First Presbyterian Church here in Newton, New Jersey. The reason for this video is just to let you know that what follows, the worship service from October 10th, does not have video. For some reason, the video portion didn't want to work. We have the audio, and you have me. Um, but other than that, uh, we don't have any other things other than some uh, stills that our, our technician, Jerry Chandler, was able to add to the uh, the video, which otherwise is actually just an audio. So I hope, nevertheless, it is um, helpful to you and spiritually fulfilling, and we will look forward to being together again very, very soon. God bless you now. Bye-bye. Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship here at First Pres, both well, those of us worshiping here in person and those that are worshiping with us on our YouTube channel. It's a delight to have this chance to be together here and wherever else we may be. Our YouTube channel is FPC Newton NJ, and the information for um, this worship service is found on our website, and that uh, is www.fpcnewtonnj.org. So delighted that we can have these connections, as I say, and as we gather for worship on this second Sunday in October already. How beautiful the march of days, the seasons come and go, as the song tells us. And so God has given us the gift of this day. So let's prepare our hearts and minds. I invite you to rise, either in body or in spirit, and join me in a call to worship. God, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our ancestors trusted. They trusted you, and you delivered them. To you they cried, and they were saved. In you they trusted, and were not put to shame. God, you are holy. All praise to you now and forever. Our opening song is 150 in the Presbyterian hymnal. Come Christians, join to sing.
God is not far from us. When trouble is near, God is our help and our refuge. Let us confess our sins to God that we might receive mercy. Please join me as we share in the unison prayer of confession. It is followed by a time for silent prayer. Let us pray. We know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. We are sure we follow them, but we do not follow you or love you, O God, with all our hearts and minds and strength. We hold back from giving our old selves to you. Forgive our disobedience, our lack of commitment, and our desire to focus on material things instead of on your will for us. In the name of our teacher, Jesus Christ, who gave his whole life for the sake of the gospel. Holy God, these are our prayers of confession. We humbly seek your forgiveness and grace. May we know the peace that is ours through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, and let the people say amen. amen. In the book of Hebrews, we hear these words. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. But we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, we can approach the throne of grace with boldness and know we will receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we find forgiveness in Christ. God has broken down the dividing walls between us and has bridged whatever distance separates us from God and from one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Thank you. Please take a moment to greet one another from a distance. Together we pray, your word, O God, is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. May your word be for us today life and action, beacon and gather. In the name of the living word we pray, amen. Our responsive reading is Psalm 22, verses 1 through 11 and 19 through 23. Let us share God's word. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried, and were saved. In you they trusted, and were not put to shame. But I am worshipped, not a human, scorned by others, and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. 
You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. But you, O Lord, do not be far away. O my God, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion, from the horns of the wild oxen who have me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. Good morning, children of God. I'm Mrs. Duffy, and welcome to our time with children. Sorry about that, but a button fell off my sweater, and I was trying to thread the needle so that I could sew it back on. But you know what? The eye of this needle, the hole in the needle, is so teeny tiny that I can't get the thread to go through it. So I guess I'll work on it a little bit later. But this does remind me of something that Jesus once said. You see, it was telling us one time that there was a very rich man that came to see Jesus, and he asked Jesus, what do I have to do for God to love me forever? I think I'm doing everything that God wants me to do, so will God always love me? Well, Jesus told the rich man, sell everything that you have and give all your money to the poor, and then come and follow me. Well, the rich man wasn't very happy with that. Sell everything? He had lots and lots of stuff and lots and lots of money, and he really loved his stuff, and he really loved his money. So he walked away, and he didn't follow Jesus. Jesus then turned to the disciples and said to them, it's hard for greedy people to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to walk through the itty bitty eye of a needle. But don't forget, for God, all things are possible. Hmm. A camel walking through the eye of a little itty bitty needle. Now, I can't believe that that is even possible. But what I think that Jesus might have been trying to say to us is that whenever we place anything in a more important position than God, we have made that thing an idol. In other words, idols are things that we put before or above our relationship with God. For example, the rich young man, he put his love for his money and his possessions before his love for God, before following Jesus' call. And you know what? We all do that sometimes. For some of us, it might be playing video games. You know, maybe the video games have become so important to us that we spend all our spare time playing video games. And we don't put God first. We don't take time to spend time with God in prayer, or to study God's word that we find in the Bible, or to worship God. We put the video games before that. Or sometimes we might even put our relationships with our friends before our relationship for God, with God. Maybe we let our friends influence the way we behave, or the way that we treat others. And instead of being guided by God's commands, to love God and to love one another, we follow along with what our friends are doing. So maybe we join in when some of our friends are calling someone in our class a name or picking on a classmate rather than follow God's call to love one another. Afraid that maybe if we don't join in with our friends, that they might get angry at us and they might not be our friends anymore. Now it doesn't mean that 
Things like video games and friends can't be important to us. But what we need to remember is that our relationship with God should be the most important. God wants us to love God more than anything or anyone else. And then God wants us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. If we love God, God will bless us and give us the ability to love others, even the ones we think we cannot love without that help from God. So God can make all things possible for us. God can help us to realize that things aren't nearly as important as people and nowhere near as important as our relationship with God. God loves you. God loves you always and no matter what. And nothing that you do can earn you that love of God. God gives it to you freely and there is nothing that you can do to lose that love. God, because God's love is forever. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, help us to love you with all our hearts and to love our neighbors as you do. Help us to notice that we are treating someone as more important than you, and then get things back in order. Thank you that you are with us and can help us to see things clearly. In your name we pray. Now, I wanted to just give you a couple of ideas, so maybe you can have some family conversation later about how do you determine if you're putting something before God. And there are three questions that you can ask yourself. Let's use video games, for instance. Do I spend more time thinking about or worrying about or playing video games than I do about thinking about God or connecting with God? Okay. Um, does playing video games lead me to disobey God? It's another question you can ask yourself. And a third one might be, do I turn to video games to bring me satisfaction instead of relying on God? So you can use those questions to determine at home whether something is an idol for you or not. And then I do have an activity for those uh, young people that are with us in worship today. And if you didn't get this on your way in, I will go get you one. But I thought it might be kind of neat to learn how to draw a camel today. Because and the instructions, step-by-step -step instructions are provided, along with sheets of paper and pencils and erasers. And it might be a reminder for us that God can make all things possible, like making a camel walk through the eye of a needle. Thank you, Colleen. Well, now let's listen to that story, shall we? It's from the Gospel of Mark, from the 10th chapter, beginning at verse 17. <clears throat> As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? <clears throat> Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. The man said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the man heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals, 
it is impossible. But not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to Jesus, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, here in Mark's Gospel, we're shown someone who seems to have it all. Wealth, youth, energy. The good life? Seems he had a clear conscience, shown by the fact that he was able to approach Jesus with, with earnest sincerity and kneel before him. Seems like he's a true seeker. And so bowing before Jesus, he asks a question. It's a rich man's question. It's the question of someone who's feeling very secure in their situation doesn't have to worry about where the next meal is coming from, or where he'll, whether he'll find a job, or whether the family will be provided for. Those are the kind of questions that other people ask. Now, this is a man who it seems has it all, but it also seems that he's maybe come to an awareness that having it all isn't quite enough. And not in the sense of that guy like, uh, I'm, I'm I'm told it was said of John D. Rockefeller when he was asked, being of course richer than Croesus, he was asked, well, tell us, how much money would be enough? And you remember maybe his answer? Just a little bit more. It's not that kind of way with this guy would seem. And so he comes to Jesus with this question. Not a question about this life. He figures that's in the bag. No, no, it's a question about that other life, that great get not morning, that eternal life. And so he comes to Jesus with this deeper question. Is it because he's looking in that bag and realizing, you know, it's not as full as I thought it would be and these things just haven't done it for me? Or is he somebody just looking for that next mountain to climb? That next goal to achieve. He's mastered every Mount Everest anyone's ever put in front of him. And so he's simply looking for uh, that next higher pinnacle to climb. Good teacher, yes. What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a good question to ask Jesus. Especially if Jesus is who we think he is. Who better to ask this question of than the Son of God? And so there's Jesus looking him over, kind of like you know, a doctor looking over a patient and arriving at a diagnosis. First, Jesus asks about his, his spiritual health. He says, you know the commandments, do this, don't do that. And on down the line it goes. How has God's treatment plan worked for you? Well, I've done all those things. I've followed God's plan to the letter. Now, we don't get a sense that he's, he's bragging or being dishonest. It's a statement of fact for him, and he knows it. And I love this line in Mark's Gospel. says that Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Loves what he sees. But what do, exactly does Jesus love about him. His forthrightness, his, his boldness, his simplicity, his eagerness. Is it his desire to be virtuous? Jesus loved him and lovingly gives him his prescription saying, okay, you lack one thing. And you can almost 
and it's not in the text, but you can almost hear a, a little bit of an intake of breath as the man's there waiting for that, what's it going to be? And this pregnant pause. You like the thing? Yes. What is going to be in that answer for his personal prescription for paradise? Well, Jesus could have said, well, you know, the next time I gather, let's say, mm, 5,000 or so, you, you can pick up the tab for dinner. He doesn't say, oh, well, how about you buy a cloak for everyone in Palestine? Or even find a job for every under, unemployed person in the county. Jesus might have said, put all your stuff in storage and head out in the mission field. No. They would have been magnificent tasks, well suited for a well-intentioned and highly motivated man of means. But what about go sell all you have, give it all away, and then come and follow me? Obviously not quite the answer that he was expecting. And so instead of adding another notch to his belt, instead of becoming even more noble, becoming even more of a celebrity, Jesus' answer sends him in the other direction. Give it all up and become a nobody. A man of no means. No longer a shaker and a mover, or a mover and a shaker, but a follower. Such a radical recipe for righteousness. The man's question has led to an answer. I had a friend, uh, half a friend, a lawyer, who said, you know, in, in law, you, only, you, you never ask a question that you one, either all, don't already know the answer to, or it, it doesn't matter what answer you get. Never ask those questions. This man asked this question. It led to an answer that he was not expecting. So now what? Will he take Jesus at his word and follow his advice? We know the answer to that. The answer is no. With his spiritual future hanging in the balance, the man's face changes from excited anticipation to deflated dejection, and the scripture tells us that he went away. He didn't just walk away in a huff. No, he went away sorrowful. This rich young guy realized that he wasn't able to follow Jesus' prescription for life because the cure was too difficult, too radical. And maybe this is the point where you may have noticed all ten of the commandments were enlisted, weren't they? Just a select few. Seems like one of the ones that didn't get make the list in Mark's gospel was, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Something that Colleen also alluded to moments ago. His wealth. Was that his God? His source of security? He might have thought he was free, but in reality, clearly, his wealth was in the way. It was a bird, trailing behind him like a ball and chain, perhaps. You know, there are those who suggest that the opposite of rich isn't poor, that the opposite of rich is free. I'd like to test that out someday, but in the meantime, Jesus here is offering him a way to become truly free, a way of being healed, relieved of his burdens. But as we've seen, the man decided the price was too much to pay. He'd rather go back to counting his assets than moving forward in the assurance that eternal life was God's and God's alone to give. And so he turns away from Jesus and leaves with this heaviness which comes from realizing he's not free at all. He comes to Jesus by himself. He leaves by himself. He's a solitary figure. Wouldn't you love to know what happened to him after that? After this encounter with the great physician, as we call Jesus, the one who diagnosed his illness and showed him way back to hell? If he didn't give it all up, did he increase his annual pledge to the synagogue? 
did this encounter with Jesus cause him to re-examine his priorities and map out a plan for living more simply so that others could simply live? Here's this young man came to the brink of new life and then stepped back. I have to wonder, did he ever figure it out? Do you think he ever realized this con the contradiction built into his question? Do you think he ever understood that the kingdom of heaven isn't ours to acquire, certainly isn't for sale? It's God's to give. So as the scriptures often do, like, you know, it's that thing that they, they turn around, they look at us. We open the book and it's the book that reads us. And is looking at us and saying, okay, well, how about us? How are we living? Have we gotten the message? Have we figured it out? Or are we still making lists of all the things we have to do to inherit eternal life? Do we just keep raising that spiritual bar? This story has given the Christian church all kinds of headaches over the years. Go, sell all you have, give it away to the undeserving poor, and then come and follow me. For wealthy Christians like us, and yes, when you look globally, my friends, we are wealthy, as we know. But when you look at this text, and it looks at us, is eternal life so painfully simple? Is selling off everything what it takes to gain eternal life? Is there anything ever that simple? Is that all we have to do? I don't think so. I do believe that we can no more buy our way into heaven by disposing of our wealth than we can say that any poor person is guaranteed eternal life just because they have any wealth. It doesn't have to be a barrier with this wealth of ours. It doesn't have to be a barrier any more than poverty is the answer. The answer lies in knowing that the answer doesn't lie with us. It's impossible for us. And as soon as we come to terms with that reality, then I think we're more open to the reality that only God makes salvation possible. And I think the good news for us today is in fact the news that God has already made salvation a reality in Christ. It's already done. He is the one who frees us from everything that might hold us back. He is the one who has given us this incredible gift and a commission. A commission to use our wealth, to use our resources, to use all that God has gifted us with, and to use it joyfully as powerful tools in the kingdom of God. And so really we're not left with just one question out of this text. There really are two questions. And the first one is, not so much what must I do to inherit eternal life, because the answer to that is nothing. You don't do anything to inherit. But that second question, what can I do to thank God for the gift of salvation? That's the Protestant Reformation question. It's Salvation is a gift. Now how do I give thanks for that gift? It cuts really right to the heart of who we are as followers of Christ. God isn't asking us to sell everything and become destitute as a precondition for discipleship. God is asking, it seems to me, for us to consider his claim upon our lives and maybe to be just a bit more socially engaged a bit more aware of the impact that even our small acts have upon the world around us. When we're able to meet the needs of five more people who come to the church asking for assistance with rent or with car insurance or with go down the list. They need gas to get to a doctor's appointment. The doctor's in Morristown and they only have enough gas to get as far as the end of the street. When we decide to commit a greater portion of what we've received so that our communal witness to Christ can be more pronounced and more enlarged, then I do believe we are engaging in that mysterious process 
of being collaborators. We are collaborators with Christ and doing it for the sake of the kingdom, which is not a way out there. It's really very close at hand, as close as that next neighbor we encounter, as close as that concern we become, become aware of, as close as our reality that the connections between us are amazing and very close and constant. You know, starting with the church picnic on September 19th, I was not able to be there, and I have to tell you, I was just, I wasn't a happy camper for not being a camp that day. But for those of you who were, it was a great time. The weather was fabulous, a lot of good things happened. You even heard some singing, reunited, you know, that was the, the theme, and we got introduced to this year's words that kind of shaped our stewardship efforts, and they were reunited, refreshed, renewed, and rededicated. So we had two weeks on the reunited theme, last week we hit the refreshment theme, and today as well, and we're considering our, our connections with Christ, our, our unity, how do we experience renewal, how do we experience refreshment as God's gift to us at, at all times? but especially perhaps in this desert journey through the COVID experience. I do hope that you will want to respond joyfully and, and generously to the invitation when it comes to rededicate ourselves, to bring our resources together, confident that we can do more together than we can do alone, and all in response to God's gift to us in Christ. You know, a church budget really is a, a reflection of our mission, of what we say we want to do. It's a, it's a tangible way of trying to put hands and, and feet to the heart that beats in the gospel, the heart that beats in each one of us. And our financial response is just one way, just one way in which we shape our identity as God's people, as individual Christians, and as the body of Christ, those for whom Christ died. Those whom, when Christ looks at us, I am confident that Christ loves us also. Do we lack one thing? I don't know about your list, but I'm sure there's more than one thing on my list. But one of those things is a sense of gratitude and, and, and generosity of spirit and a desire to be part of the inbreaking of that kingdom of God that is such a wonderful thing to be a part of. And my prayer is that we here at First President Newton, whether we're here in person or wherever we might be, can become even a more vital community of care and concern, of outreach and compassion for Jesus' sake. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, even if we think about those things that we lack, and that winds up being a very long list, remind us that it's never in balance because the weight of your glorious love for us in Christ always takes precedent. The gifts that you have given us always outweigh what we lack. The good news of your gospel, which is too good to keep to ourselves, impels us forward compels us into community, guides us. So as this week unfolds, oh God, show us how we might both experience your refreshment, but also be agents of refreshment for others, and to do it all for Jesus' sake. And let God's people say, Amen. Amen. <laughs>
in our worship guide. And so together we say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We proclaim Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen one, confessing him as Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we acclaim Jesus as the Lord of the Church, the head over all things, the beginning of a new creation. We acknowledge that we live and work between the time of Christ's death and resurrection and the final consummation of all things which he will bring. We are a pilgrim people, always on the way towards the promised whole. On the way, Christ feeds us with word and sacrament, and we have the gift of the Spirit and the light of God's love in order that we may not lose the way. We will live and work within the faith and unity of the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, bearing witness to that unity which is both Christ's gift and his will. We affirm that every member of the Church is called to confess the faith of Christ crucified. Together with all the people of God, we will serve the world for which Christ died, and we await with hope the day of the Lord Jesus. Friends, you may be seated. The weekly announcements are mailed out in an email form uh, called the Friday Blast. And if it comes on Thursday, well, that's just a, a, an extra time for previewing what's going on on the weekend, but also into the coming week. If you'd like to be on our mailing list, please let us know. We'd be happy to share that information. There's also a short list of, of uh, scheduled activities as part of the worship guide, and you should have that with you this morning. So do take note that um, neither the youth group nor the adult study will be meeting this evening, and that tomorrow those of you who are part of the Word Word Wordy will not be meeting also. We have a midweek Vespers, 8 o'clock on Zoom on Wednesday evenings, 15, 20 minutes, catching up catching up with God, and if you'd like to be a part of that, the information is there as well. Well, there are a number of things also there. Um, Colleen, you want to say more about what's happening on, on Sunday mornings? Just give us a, some uh, highlights of your intergenerational activities. I didn't mean to spring that on you, so. Oh, no problem. <laughs> well, this was week two of our four-week intergenerational program um, based on Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, and we've had a nice gathering of uh, children and adults uh, where we're exploring what it means to be a neighbor. Today we discussed um, how do we bring peace to our neighborhoods and the insights that we get from the children are amazing. So each lesson does stand alone. There are two more um, and you are welcome to join us. We begin at 9 a.m. next Sunday and we go for about an hour. Um, so please think about joining us. April, you want to bring a word about the refreshment, a refreshing word for gratitude and stewardship. Well, good morning. As Pastor David has outlined for us, we are in the midst of our stewardship uh, pledge uh, campaign this fall, and of course the the four words that we've been concentrating on, we spent a couple of weeks talking about being reunited. And of course, being reunited at the picnic was really wonderful, a source of refreshment, I think, for all of us. So last week, we began thinking about the word refresh. And how have we been refreshed over these past few months? And as you can see on the board over there on that side of the sanctuary, Many of you participated last week in filling out the lovely little page that is on the front of the Order of Worship again today in ways that you have been refreshed. And I took a few moments to um, come up before service today and take a look at some of the things that people have been putting on their uh, paper. And it's really wonderful. I especially like the one, and you don't have to fess up to it, but I love the one where somebody said they were refreshed detailing their car, um, which really spoke to me. I said, well, maybe that would be refreshing for me. It certainly needs to be done. Um, at any rate, uh, I invite uh, those of you who are here and uh, 
service today and those of you who are worshiping with us at home, you can send in, um, email those to us at the office. And those of you who are here this morning, if you would take a few moments before you leave today uh, and fill out uh, that form and then just leave it in the offering plate on your way out. And do take a minute to come up and read some of these um, things that have been uh, refreshing for people. And one of the ways that I've been personally refreshed is to be here back in service um, in person with everyone, praying together, singing together, uh, worshiping together. And uh, with that in mind, uh, the stewardship uh, team is hosting a little refreshment. How many times are we going to hear that word today? Uh, over in uh, Fellowship Hall after service. So we invite you to come over with us, uh, spend some time chatting, catching up with one another. And uh, as the Apostle Paul had said to the church at Corinth, that being together is a source of refreshment for one another. So we invite you to join us after service. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Well, if you are not familiar, here at First Presbyterian Church of Newton, on the second Sunday of the month, we collect an offering of spare change to help fight hunger in our community. We call this offering the Bucket Brigade. The money that we collect, the coins, the dollar bills, the checks, are used to buy ShopRite gift cards as well as gas cards for individuals and families that come to our door looking for a little bit of help. Um, I just want to um, tell you about a young woman that called this week in need of gas. She was actually on her way home. She has some severe medical conditions. She has four little children. And she was on her way home from her doctor's visit where she's getting in therapy um, from Hackensack. And she was just rolling into Newton and had 1.5 miles left on her gas tank before she ran out of gas. And your generosity allowed us to fill her gas tank. We met her at the gas station and were able to fill her tank. She had no food in the house, and your generosity allowed us to give her a Shopify gift card so that she could get some food for herself and her four children. So uh, the money that you give so generously is so important. Um, we usually go and send the children out into the congregation with our buckets, <laughs> but we have strategically placed them near the offering plate. So if you would like to drop some donations in on your way as you're out of worship this morning, it will be greatly appreciated and used very wisely. Um, and if you are not worshiping with us in person today and would like to donate toward the Bucket Brigade, you can go on our website and give uh, e-donate. Click the e-donate button to give, or you can mail in a check and just be sure to uh, mark it for Bucket Brigade. So when we pull our smaller gifts together, they can have an amazing, amazing impact on the community that we serve. When we give our gifts to God and for the work of God's kingdom, we are proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. The gifts we give, whether they are monetary gifts or gifts of our time or our talents, they are given in gratitude for God's amazing love that we find in Christ Jesus. Let us give from all our gifts abundantly to God's work here in this place in this time. Please join, rise in body or in spirit and join me as we sing together the dots out.
Friends, you may be seated. As we come to a time of our morning prayers, I hope we're slowly getting get back into the practice of uh, uh, adding our prayer joys and concerns on the way in through, through the parlor entrance. Um, used to be we had these in the pew racks, and of course, with the onset of COVID, we removed all that from, from the pews, or much of it, I should say. Uh, but the prayer list, nevertheless, is uh, provided on a weekly basis, also an email version, and uh, so to guide us in our uh, prayers for one another throughout the week. A couple of uh, things to take note of. Um, Janice has asked for prayers for her friend Roxanne's family. Uh, Roxanne's 35-year-old daughter, Sarah, died after contracting COVID. Catherine's asking for prayers for her uncle, Bob, who's dealing with some heart and kidney issues. Chuck and his family are mourning the loss of his sister, Judy, who died on October 4th. But some good news, and that is that um, um, Chuck and Margaret's daughter, Megan, has been on our prayer list for quite some time, dealing with some um, chronic health issues, and I'm not sure how many times she has uh, applied and been denied disability, but she did it one more time, and it went through. So that's an answer to prayer. I'm glad to hear that. We also learned of the uh, death in August of June Johnson, longtime member of this congregation, who apparently had, had, had some of the choir, had been uh, Sunday school superintendent, well, the list, I'm sure, I don't even know the list, but I did not have the opportunity to know June personally, but uh, many of you have did, and uh, so I know you joined with her family in celebrating her life and giving thanks to God for her witness. Well, brothers and sisters, as we come to this time of morning prayers, I invite you to join with me in the pastoral prayer and then the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, sometimes the troubles of this world seem impossible for us to address, and the burdens of our lives seem too much for us to bear. Even so, we trust that you, O oh God, are with us, and that for you nothing is impossible. For you alone can save us, and therefore we know we can be bold to offer up our prayers and to trust in your mercy and in your grace. And so this day, O oh God, we pray for peace among the nations of the earth. We pray for food for all who hunger, justice for those who have been too long denied. And we pray, O oh God, for a life of dignity for all your children. This day, O oh God, we pray for new life in the church, for fresh energy in mission, yes, for refreshment in fellowship and in community. We pray for faithfulness in ministry and reconciliation in the body of Christ. This day, O oh God, we pray for the welfare of our communities, for safe streets and homes, for safety in schools and workplaces, for a spirit of, of love and of civility and a sense of commonwealth among all people. This day, O oh God, we pray for those who are suffering in mind or body or circumstance. We ask for comfort for the afflicted, hope for the despairing, and strength for those who care for them. We ask, O oh God, for the consolation of your spirit for those grieving the loss of loved ones this day. Lord God, you are the one for whom all things are possible, and so we commend these, our prayers, to you, and we commit our lives to seeking your will, not just for us, but for all creation. 
And so we lift up our prayers in the strong name of Jesus, our Lord, praying as he taught us to pray and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit to join me in psalm once more. The psalm is titled, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy Like the Wideness of the Sea. You'll find it also on page 298 in the Presbyterian Hymnal.